From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. On this show, we look at the darker side of business, politics, sports, and society to better understand the forces behind corruption and deceit in our country. What exactly drives someone to break the rules and what happens when they get caught? Scandals have shaped America since its founding, and we're confronted with new ones every day. So from time to time, we want to take a break from our deep dives into the scandals of the past to explore today's biggest outrages. That's what we're doing today. We've got a special interview with a reporter who's been following one of the most controversial figures of 2018 and 2019. My client took this polygraph test in May of 2011, May 19th, 2011. She was asked specific questions. She passed with flying colors as the polygraph report that we produced shows. Michael Avenatti is a lawyer turned celebrity who represented Stephanie Clifford, or Stormy Daniels, in her legal dispute with President Trump and Michael Cohen in 2018. Daniels, an adult film star, alleged Trump and his team paid her $130,000 in hush money to keep silent about an affair she said she had with Trump back in 2006. She hired Avenatti to get out of her non-disclosure agreement, one that she says was invalid because Trump never signed it. Where is this guy? Why won't he come oh, and he'll, sit? Oh, he'll no, come. why won't he come oh, and sit because in this obviously, chair? Wait a minute, let me finish. There's me other. Finish. I'll, 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 no, 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 no I want to answer that no, question. Let me finish. You get he's it. been invited numerous no, no, times. No, no, no. Okay. He won't come on the right. show. So he, he's dodging the question. He is not dodging, he's dodging the question. The question. He, he has to hide behind other, you. Where is this guy? Where is this guy? Avenatti took his case to the court of public opinion and became a fixture on cable television news throughout 2018. He railed against President Trump, Michael Cohen, and their lawyers, and became something of a folk hero to many who opposed the president. I believe that our party, the Democratic Party, must be a party that fights fire with fire. Avenatti even announced plans to run for president in 2020 as a Democrat. But just as his star was rising, reports about his past started to come out. Bankruptcies, tax evasion, fraud, and a new charge attempting to extort Nike. Just last week, Avenatti was indicted on 36 counts by a federal grand jury in California, a host of tax offenses, concealment of funds, and embezzlement of client money. His is a remarkable saga of a man who has chased scandal in his entire career, but now finds himself at the center of his own. We speak today with Michael Finnegan, a political reporter for the LA Times. He's been covering Avenatti for the past year and a half. He joined me from the LA Times studios. Here's our conversation. Michael Finnegan, thanks for coming on American Scandal. Thank you for having me. Now, attorney Michael Avenatti, he has some history, and I'm sure we'll get to that. But for most of us, we've only ever heard of him recently. He's a lawyer representing adult film star Stormy Daniels in her case against President Trump. So let's start the story when he first comes on the scene in 2018. Can you set the stage and tell us what happened? Sure. Uh, Stormy Daniels was not somebody that Michael Avenatti knew. He was a plaintiff's lawyer in Newport Beach. He'd done a couple high-profile cases, but was not well-known at all, and When uh, she went public uh, with a lawsuit to get out of her non-disclosure agreement with President Trump over an alleged affair that they had back in 2006, Michael Avenatti kind of burst onto the public scene as uh, a constant presence on cable television, uh, uh, talking about the case. He was sort of thrust out of nowhere into the biggest scandal in the country. And he had kind of a natural uh, way uh, with the the media, was kind of a strong presence uh, for cable, especially with the kind of uh, conflict that they like. He's a very pugnacious person. And um, what uh, most people didn't know at that time was that Michael Avenatti was a character with all kinds of problems in his past that were catching up to him in a very big way. And of course, a year later would uh, 
result in his arrest. Can you recap for us the specifics of the Stormy Daniels suit? Well, Stormy Daniels sued the president to get uh, a non-disclosure agreement nullified. Uh, she had accepted a $130,000 payment just before the 2016 presidential election uh, in return for keeping quiet about her alleged affair with the president. And the president's lawyers were threatening uh, privately to go after her for millions of dollars in penalties for violating the agreement by talking about uh, her uh, past with uh, with President Trump uh, publicly. She had started to hint uh, in television appearances about it. She was doing a tour of strip clubs around the country called the uh, Make America Horny Again Tour. So that was uh, a huge story, of course, when it broke and, and Michael Avenatti became, uh, he kind of thrust himself right into the middle of it. He ultimately, of course, lost that lawsuit and as the scandal unfolded, filed a second lawsuit on behalf of Stormy Daniels, uh, alleging that the president had uh, defamed her at one point and uh, lost that one too, and wound up uh, st- uh, that that resulted in a in a in a court order that Stormy Daniels pay the president's legal fees, nearly three hundred thousand dollars, which ironically is uh, almost uh, well more than double. Uh, what uh, the original hush money payment that she received was. So it hasn't turned out well for either Avenatti or Stormy Daniels. You mentioned that uh, Avenatti did not know Daniels in the other way around. How did he come to represent her? That's a secret. Uh, People do not know. Avenatti and Stormy Daniels have not said publicly how they uh, met. Uh, uh, So we do not know. Avenatti has a lot of other secrets, too. And as you mentioned, they're catching up with him. Let's go back a little further before 2018. What what sort of lawyer was Avenatti before he became a figure in the public's awareness? Uh, Avenatti was a plaintiff's lawyer. It's kind of this uh, boom and bust uh, business where you work on contingency. You know, you take on a lot of risk by suing a big corporation for wrongdoing um, in the hopes of getting a huge verdict or settlement payment. And occasionally uh, he did, which is why he was able to live uh, very, very well uh, for, for a period. And um, uh, that, that, that was the essence of his business before, before this happened. And was he successful as a, as a plaintiff's lawyer? He was a successful plaintiff's lawyer. But um, to, to me, the, the fascinating thing about Avenatti is that when all of a sudden he's a very high-profile attorney in this uh, Stormy Daniels case— he knows that he has uh, a past of uh, financial troubles and legal disputes uh, that that could put him in in very very serious jeopardy, uh, and ultimately did. Uh, and the big question is why somebody who knows that they have all this trouble uh, that could come to light would. Uh, take such a high profile and a big scandal like this. Well, let's talk about his troubles then in specific, because he did win some very big cases. So, I mean, millions, tens of millions of dollars. How did he find himself now so low that he's accused of tax evasion and embezzlement? Well, part of it, it started in about 2009, 2010, when he uh, was not paying his personal income taxes. And uh, that ultimately came to light years later when the IRS put a personal lien on him for almost a million dollars. And what we now know, according to the IRS, is that since 2010, he has filed no personal income tax returns at all, even though he has deposited, according to the IRS, uh, about $18 million into his bank accounts. And he also had a private company that he owned. It's called Avenatti and Associates. And he did a lot of his business through that company. And since 2000, from, I guess it's from 2011 to 2017, that company deposited uh, about $38 million into its bank accounts, according to the IRS, but also filed no tax returns. Um, so those were those were the big issues. And then his other big tax problems were at 
uh, a company, a coffee company that he bought up in Washington State back in uh, 2013 for uh, $9 million. Uh, it, it operated the Tully's chain of uh, coffee uh, stores uh, in, in the Northwest. And uh, in that case, uh, he was withholding payroll taxes from employee paychecks but spending the money instead of sending it to the government, according to the IRS. And that's a very serious matter. And uh, back around 2015, 2016, the IRS started uh, looking at that and investigating what was going on. And uh, it became a very big problem. And even after the Stormy Daniels uh, story broke, uh, some reporters asked him about it, and he blamed the payroll companies, right? But the IRS now, in these criminal charges that have been brought against Avenatti, uh, says that it was exactly the opposite. He stopped using the payroll companies to process the paychecks and then started keeping all of the money uh, that was supposed to be going to the government. And the IRS also says he was doing the same thing at his law firm, Egan Avenatti. Now, he hasn't been charged yet with uh, with uh, a tax crime per se, but uh, the legal papers that the IRS and the U.S. Attorney's Office in uh, uh, Southern California have filed um, make it clear that he's under investigation for tax evasion and bankruptcy fraud and a whole bunch of other crimes. Well, this um, string of almost comic criminality um, and mismanagement seems to really cut against his public persona uh, as a full-throated crusader for justice. Um, how do you reconcile these these two aspects of him? Well, uh, it's hard to reconcile these two aspects of him. He, uh, you know, certainly grew up in, in, in a, uh, a family with a modest income. Uh, he, 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 you know, put himself through... Uh, law school at night at George Washington uh, University and um, really kind of worked his way into uh, access, a successful law practice. Um, but um, the litigation that has uh, surrounded him over the last decade or so has made clear that uh, at least his ad the way his adversaries see it, he cheats other lawyers uh, and um, and even now the government is charging uh, at least one of his own clients um, uh, as a matter of course. Um, so it, it it is hard to reconcile the two sort of versions of Avenatti uh, that that uh, that you see. Tax evasion is not his only crisis at the moment. He is also apparently uh, alleged to have tried to extort Nike. That's correct. The, that case, you could argue that this is what lawyers, aggressive lawyers, do in high-stakes business negotiations, but the government um, argues that it's full-scale extortion. The language that he used uh, in dealing with, with Nike was, was extremely aggressive um, and warned them that he was going to uh, harm their reputation so badly that it would cost them billions of dollars and things like that. And um, in the government's view, that's that's extortion. Well, let's go into the particulars of that case. Um, what 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 did he have on Nike, and and how did it how does it differ from an arrangement that like uh, for instance, uh, President Trump arranged with Stormy Daniels? Well, he told Nike that he had a client. Uh, who had evidence that Nike had been making improper payments to high school athletes and their families and was going to have a press conference to expose that unless they paid the client a million uh, and change and uh, hired him and fellow lawyer uh, Mark Garagos of, uh, of California um, and paid them upwards of, of $20 million uh, to do an investigation of, uh, of this kind of uh, thing inside Nike. And, and he warned uh, the lawyers for Nike that, that he could damage the company tremendously if he went public and uh, told them that he would, he would walk away if they would pay the money.
So what does Avenatti say about these tax and extortion charges? Uh, well, he he's denies any wrongdoing, and uh, he also has been attacking Nike for alleged wrongdoing. Um, he's been notably quiet about the allegations in the California prosecution. He's charged in California with bank fraud and wire fraud. Um, in one case, he's alleged to have submitted uh, phony income tax returns to a bank in Mississippi in order to get more than $4 million in business loans. These were years when he wasn't actually filing income tax returns, according to the IRS, um, but submitted these phony returns in order to get the money. Um, and then in the wire fraud case, he's alleged to have embezzled $1.6 million from a client. Uh, and uh, in that case, he... Uh, had the money from a, a settlement wired to a, a bank account that he controlled, uh, but the money was supposed to belong to the client, and he is alleged to have never told the client that the money had arrived and then spent it all. I'm trying to understand what might have compelled him to raise his profile I, I almost understand it. I mean, he he has a, a history of big risk um, employment, you know, well, big risk opportunities. He lives on the edge, this this gray area of, of legality anyways, um, takes some gambles all the way and sees Stormy Daniel as a big opportunity to raise his profile and then, of course, perhaps earn more and get bigger cases. But all the while, he knows that he's on a knife's edge, that this baggage even if he's innocent of all of he's accused of, it's still very suspicious. And then he contemplates running for president himself in 2020. It, it, it was quite extraordinary. And, and people who knew him, especially those who had uh, fought him in court over the years, were astonished that he would get anywhere near a campaign for president of the United States, um, you know, setting aside whether he was qualified or not, um, people who were familiar with his litigation history and his courtroom history and his sort of scorched earth disputes with fellow lawyers and things like that were absolutely astonished that he was holding himself out there as, as, as a potential candidate for president. But you know, in some corners of the Democratic Party, there, there was an appetite for a sort of Trump-like fighter to take on the president in uh, the president's own style, you know, and it sort of, you know, pugnaciousness and, and nastiness. That it comes very naturally to, to Michael Avenatti. And so there was a little, uh, there was a, a short period there where he was dead serious about pursuing a uh, candidacy for president. He was in Iowa, New Hampshire, and going all over the country. He was a star speaker at at party fundraisers. And uh, when he was uh, arrested on suspected uh, domestic violence, uh, uh, that pretty much ended uh, not not entirely, but it it definitely slowed down his television appearances. Now, uh, those you know prosecutors opted not to pursue that case. Um, uh, and and he has continued though uh, to to appear on television once in a while, but much less than before. You know, he's sort of gravitated to some high profile cases like uh, the sexual abuse cases against uh, R. Kelly and uh, immigration cases involving uh, families, uh, immigrant families at the border, uh, and of course the case of a, of a of a woman who made accusations against the. Supreme Court Justice uh, Kavanaugh during his uh, confirmation hearings. I can guess the answer to this, but I want your opinion. Um, when someone runs for office, it's hopefully to improve the country, but often to improve themselves. What was Avenatti trying to do there? You know, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't know what he was thinking, knowing uh, especially about his tax history. Um, I, I don't know what would have led him to sort of run with this uh, idea that he might succeed in in politics. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, he, he, he ran with it. 
Well, let's talk about your coverage of Avenatti. When did you first take him on as a subject? Well, when the uh, Stormy Daniels uh, lawsuits began in March 2018, I started covering those, and I very quickly uh, started hearing from uh, adversaries of, of Avenatti over the years who uh, who thought that he was an interesting story, and I started to look at it, and and we decided, nah, he's not he's not high enough profile. It's not it's not important enough, you know, his background. He's just a lawyer for Stormy Daniels, and she's the figure who's important in the scandal. But after just a few weeks, it became clear, no, 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 he he is a, a, an important figure who who is worth looking at, and. Um, and so the the you know the tax liens and the and the con- legal conflicts over his coffee company um, were were part of the sort of early story of uh, who is this guy and 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 what's his background um, and then uh, it just started to get more interesting because he had had some really nasty disputes with uh, law partners. Um, In uh, 2007, he opened a law firm in Newport Beach called uh, Egan, O'Malley, and Avenatti, and uh, they won some big, high-profile cases. Um, uh, One was against SCI, the big uh, cemetery company, and uh, the money really started rolling in, and when it started rolling in, um, he and one of the partners, uh, John O'Malley, uh, uh, got into a, uh, a, a nasty uh, fight, uh, but O'Malley wound up winning $2.7 million, um, uh, saying that Avenatti had kind of kicked him out of the firm uh, you know, improperly. But then in 2015, there was another uh, law partner by the name of Jason Frank, who uh, left the firm with a couple other lawyers um, and uh, made allegations that Avenatti had cheat him, cheated him out of ten or fifteen million dollars in pay that he was entitled to, and Frank turned out to be an unbelievably dogged person in in chasing down that money and. He uh, wound up, uh, after uh, the law firm went into bankruptcy for a year, he wound up getting a $10 million judgment against the firm, and then um, he wound up getting a $5 million personal judgment against uh, Avenatti. And this story of, of how Avenatti was sort of sinking in deeper and deeper financial troubles just became more and more interesting. And of course, Avenatti is probably aware of your coverage of him. You know, he is a, uh, he's not a shy person at all. He's, a, he's often described as an in-your-face kind of person, and he's that way with reporters, too. He is very savvy about the media and the needs of uh, television programs or uh, newspapers, uh, whatever it might be. Um, and he works the system very effectively. He knows uh, what a scoop is and offers scoops to reporters. And he, uh, when he doesn't like a story or a line of questioning, can be extremely aggressive in pushing back. And so on a few occasions, uh, Avenatti is, has confronted me personally and publicly um, uh, in courtroom hallways, for instance, um, and uh, attacked the, you know, I'm, you know, you're a disgrace to your profession, that kind of thing. And, um, and so that, that's never fun um, as a reporter, um, but you know, you have an obligation to sort of listen to to what he has to say and to the extent that he's raising legitimate concerns about uh, accuracy or fairness or those kinds of things uh, that that should be addressed. Um, that's that's what you do and and that's what that's what we've done. Um, but um, it, uh, it it's it, it's not fun to have someone. Uh, uh, you know, berate you in in uh, in public, and that's something that uh, it's it's not unique to me either. Uh, I you know, 
uh, seen him uh, call other people, and not necessarily even journalists, a disgrace to their professions too. So it's just his, his, his style can be uh, a little difficult to deal with. Well, he's certainly on brand. His aggressiveness is perhaps the the one thing that we all know about him. And it's the thing that he hangs his hat on as well. Uh, he has claimed that the Stormy Daniel story would have been a two-day story were it not for him, that he himself was the one who brought the scandal to light and carried it forward in the media. What do you think he thinks his role is? Is, is he a lawyer or is he um, a, a, a publicist? Well, you have to remember that the Stormy Daniels case did uh, kind of create, and his high-profile role in that case did create a space for him to get high-profile clients and get a hearing in situations like uh, like the Nike situation. Um, they'll they'll take the meeting, you know, and and so um, has this, you know, scandal provided him. Uh, a potential boost to his legal career, you know, in one sense, yes. And he, you know, I, I he deserves some credit for uh, what he said early on in the scandal uh, about what the president and Michael Cohen were up to with the hush money payment to his client, Stormy Daniels. I mean, yes, he lost the lawsuit, but in the scheme of things, when he was out there saying that uh, Michael Cohen was going to be indicted and the president knew about all of this, um, you have to keep in mind that that months later, that all proved to be true. Uh, the, the you know Michael Cohen uh, pleaded guilty to two felonies. Well, well, one felony directly related to the hush money payment to Stormy Daniels, and federal prosecutors in New York uh, did conclude uh, and say publicly that. Uh, the president uh, directed that uh, illegal hush money payment. So when he first sort of came out of the gate uh, saying all of the seemingly outlandish things he was saying, well, a a substantial portion of it was true. Um, Now, the feds were already investigating Michael Cohen before he came on the scene and and they uncovered plenty of evidence, uh, you know, through search warrants and whatnot that 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 had nothing to do with Michael Avenatti uh, that uh, that led them down the path to this prosecution. But um, but it, it you know it wouldn't be fair to to say he doesn't deserve any credit for what wound up happening. Now you've got a background reporting on corruption and scandal. You uh, spent years at the New York Daily News before moving to the L.A. Times. I'm wondering, you know, when we when we think about scandal, when we tell stories of scandal, we often seek a moral to the story. Just naked outrage isn't satisfying to anyone. We want to understand what happened and that there might be comeuppance. Is there a moral to this story, to Avenatti's story? I don't know if there's a moral or not, but I do think that there's a a nagging question, which is why did he uh, thrust himself into the public light so aggressively when he had, uh, according to the government, committed some crimes himself uh, that that he was risking uh, bringing to light. You know, I mean, a lot of a private person often who has been you know less than stellar uh, in paying their taxes can often work it out with the IRS privately and and that's just not known but in a case like this uh you know you're all but uh tempting the prosecutors to come after you because you're going to uh get a lot of public attention if they prosecute you and you're going to be a, a kind of vehicle for deterrence for other people who might be tempted to, uh, uh, you know, uh, break the law. Uh, so, I, I, I and I, you know what, and I can't tell you why he did that, other than he was really tempted uh, with the opportunity to become a, a top tier celebrity lawyer who would make 
the millions and millions of dollars that he needed to sustain a lifestyle that, by all appearances, he didn't actually have the means to to sustain. I mean, uh, among other things that that have become public, uh, you know, he w- during these years when he was according to the IRS, skipping out on millions of dollars of uh, taxes and not bothering to file tax returns and whatnot, you know, he, he, he bought a, a private uh, a jet, uh, you know, albeit one that, you know, you have to refuel to, to get all the way across the country, uh, but it was still a private jet, you know, and he, he spent money on, uh, uh, you know, a Ferrari and a Porsche, uh, I mean, six figures uh, at Porsche dealers. And, um, you know, the the oceanfront house was seven million bucks. And uh, I mean, he's just, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on watches. Uh, he he had a seriously uh, lavish uh, lifestyle to to uphold. and And by all appearances, he couldn't. His business, you know, had gone bankrupt, and he hadn't been paying his taxes. Um, and you could see where uh, this this uh, celebrity, uh, you know, the possibility of of, uh, of being a big celebrity lawyer uh, uh, would would have, would have been tempting. You know, maybe he could afford it after all. But you know, o- only he could could tell us. I don't know. The interesting thing ab- about writing about someone like Avenatti is, is, the, is the nuance. I think that it can be uh, uh, tempting sometimes uh, for, uh, for reporters to, to see, uh, um, uh, especially when you're in a rush, um, uh, sort of a one-dimensional, is this a bad guy or is this a good guy kind of uh, thing. And... Uh, to me, the the nuance of all the different things that were going on with him, that that's much more interesting. Somebody who uh, uh, is a complicated mix of of different things, you know. I mean, he on the one hand, in in some of these cases, uh, like people whose families, uh, uh, you know, uh, loved ones were uh, their remains weren't. Uh, handled properly by the owners of, uh, of of a cemetery, you know he's out there fighting for them. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, he's got all kinds of uh, financial uh, shenanigans. It would appear that 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 don't look too good going on, and it's kind of capturing the the motives and the uh, uh, sort of complexities of it. I, I I find that a lot more interesting than just nail someone kind of thing. I don't, I, don't, I don't particularly like that kind of coverage. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time and talking to us today on American Scandal. Well, thank you. That was my conversation with LA Times political reporter Michael Finnegan. You can read more of his reporting on Michael Avenatti in the LA Times or find him on Twitter at FinneganLAT. From Wondery, this is episode 8 of 8 of the Hare Krishna Murders for American Scandal. On the next series, we investigate the underbelly of the music industry, what makes a song a hit, and how much of that success is due to bribery and corruption, or as the record industry calls it, payola. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. This episode was produced by Katie Long. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Marsha Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.